Greetings peoples and welcome to another edition of the CM Kozeman Q&A special. This is a part of this channel where we take questions from patreon.com and if you want to ask new questions the link is in the video description and in the pinned comment so it's still not too late. This is in essence a baroque form of super chats in which if you donate to me on patreon.com i eventually list down everybody's questions and answer them in short bursts of videos like this one that you are listening to here so let's get cracking with it before going i will of course repeat my daily adage reminding you all to like subscribe and leave a comment in the video comments and please consider supporting my channel on patreon.com or if you're already donating try getting me a cup of coffee at buymecoffee.com or if you want some cm cosman related goodness just go to the new merch store the links are all in the video description and in the pinned comment. Okay, let's go. Last batch of questions. Let's go through all the answers. Noah Turner says, I'm confused. Are you streaming or are we supposed to ask questions in this comment section? This is just a starter, of course. Yes, you are supposed to ask questions in the comment section. And basically, this is how this goes. It's a very baroque form of super chats because I'm not monetizing this channel. YouTube Joseph WM says, Mr. Kozman, I saw your Snyat project with male and female creatures. I think each world would have its own set of genders, so it would not apply, he says. Well, maybe, but in this world there are male and female genders, and you can call them anything you want. The, the trick is simple. One gender provides half of the chromosomal contents and another gender provides the other half. And the gender that gestates the young is called the female. It's just a matter of semiotics past that point. More questions from YouTube Joseph WM. Can you please make to toys for all tomorrows? If you do, I hope they don't cost more than $10. And uh, please give your Patreons a shout out at the end of your videos. Okay, let's break this down. Shout out to all my Patreons, including you, Joseph. About the toys, I would love to do this, but there is a simple matter of budgets. It just costs a lot of money to find somebody to do these toys. And remember, even if you have the money, you also need to find a talented artist to sculpt these things. And then you have to have a company, you have to like contact a company that does the wax casts or like plastic casts and like you have to have a production run and these things all cost money and unfortunately i cannot spare that sort of expense at the moment that being said if anybody wants to do fan art sculptures of all tomorrow's creatures i would be more than happy more than happy to indulge you i've been getting some great fan art recently in fact the cover image of this video is by the inimitable korean cartoon artist Mossa Cannibalis depicting a creature from Snyat, my world building project, together with one of the local local colonists there. So yeah, it's a it's a great form of fan art and like the colonist is also really beautiful. Wow. So yeah, more questions. The Siren Lord says, okay, I have thrown in a question here. Speculative evolution artists today sadly seem to have a bias towards megafauna when designing creatures. I was wondering what your opinions are on trilobites, both as animals as and in their place in speculative evolution. What do you think their diversity would be if they hadn't gone extinct? Well, it's a really great question. Trilobites are extremely diverse. If you don't know what trilobites are, they are these like ancient sea bug looking creatures that, that are kind of like a, a staple in many paleo art book. But the thing with trilobites is they were probably much more diverse than we think. And we know many, many fossil trilobites and even there there are some crazy forms like with loads of spikes spiraling horns some of them are flat some of them are gnarly some of them can roll into balls some of them are blind others have gigantic comparatively eyes and just recently at the time of recording let's just google this for now just a second snake trilobite let me google one more there was just this recent discovery of a form of trilobite with an elongated body I'm just googling long trilobite now, but yeah, it's kind of hard. But anyways, at the at the time of recording, the 9th of November 2023, I had just seen news of a kind of long-bodied trilobite, almost like a, a sea worm. 
being discovered and unfortunately I cannot I cannot seem to find this discovery by googling at the same time as recording so you'll just have to take my word for it but yeah this thing is a discovery and almost certainly there are many many forms of trilobites that we can't even imagine that must have lived so I think even if we commission 10 spec evo artists and tell them like go wild with the trilobites i think their designs would be tame compared to some of the real actual trilobites out there so make of that what you will certainly if trilobites hadn't died out they may have gone through some more drastic radiations and in fact we could have come to a point even similar to the diversity of insects in the present day and age you might be surprised to realize that genetic analysis plays insects and related hexapods squarely within crustaceans so they're not like a side tangent to crustaceans they are crustaceans that are just incredibly specialized for life on land so we know that to be true then if we could look at the speculative evolution of trilobites we could have had like a tangent group of insect like arthropods that are not insects but look like insects that descended from trilobites instead of other mainline crustaceans so in that respect i think spec evo for trilobites leaves a lot to be explored that's all i can say sebastian pd says what are your thoughts about speculative evolution being a form of environmental escapism in which we use to temporarily alleviate the anxiety and depression caused by the degradation of our planet i think all fantasy is a bit like that don't you think i mean i think throughout literature itself we find expressions relating to escaping to worlds of fantasy daydreaming even in like these cheesy south park jokes where the kid dreams about running away on a flying dragon riding it together with a beautiful hot sexy princess you know fantasy is always a form of escapism and i think fantasy containing creatures dream creatures dream animals dream people dream individuals dream entities it's also a subset of an escapism in which maybe even the psyche turns on itself and populates a world full of different creatures to alleviate our sense of loneliness so in that case that is still there and of course when we come to the specific specificities of speculative evolution well speculative evolution is at least on surface more scientifically rigorous we invent environments we invert in uh, we invent worlds of diversity so i think maybe we are trying to create our dream ecosystems i know from myself that when i was a teenager and designing these big ass spec our worlds i was always thinking about like i want to have what that guy is having but different so i would look at nature i would see maybe giant sauropod dinosaurs but say yeah i want that but different or i would read some work of fiction i don't know the alien series or something and i would want to have a creature with a parasitic life cycle and i would be like i want to have that but different so it's like building your own world in a way so in that case i think there's some escapism and in certain projects like the serena project of course the environmental angle is really acute you know the serena project is a speculative world of birds and fish and strange birds and stranger fish that's just wonderful and beautiful and even the poignancy of art there in my opinion harkens to the wistful feelings we get when contemplating the plight of nature today so there let me take a sip of tea oh man it feels good to be recording this always a pleasure to answer your questions and you know i'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart so please consider supporting me i won't stop repeating this message you know everybody is in need of support these days i hope you're all having a good time you know wherever you are in the world okay ryan says i was wondering if you could host a contest where people could design a creature for snayat like what's been done for ftanumbi recently uh, a bit of context ftanumbi is a great world building project by steve mob cannon and recently there was a contest and people designed their creatures for it and it was like wonderful i won fourth place i'm proud of my creature but i wish some other people had won all the all the ranking places anyways and then now these projects are gonna get canonized so they're gonna be made into part of tanumbi so I'm, I'm really proud about that 
Um, alright, so I actually, when I was making Snyad all the way back in 2007, 6, you know, prehistoric times like that, I did ask people to design creatures and a lot of dear friends, especially Jonas Insign Insignia, who's probably listening to this, probably listening to this right now, came up with loads and loads of creatures and even this day, every like five, six months, I get like creature people submitting their ideas for creatures. In fact, he just recently Mossa Cannibalist designed a kind of all like strange creature for Snaya too. And I don't want to have a contest because I don't want to feel indebted to people. Plus I have I don't have much time, you know. I'm I'm dealing with multiple projects every day. So I don't think I will have a contest, but if you feel like you got a creature that you would want to see in Snaya, just share with me and I'll see how it goes. Another reason is copyright issues. I am going to rewrite Snaya and redo it as a big book. And when people send in creatures, you know, technically I could just take them and put it in the book. But I mean, so it's a kind of iffy area. I just want to be clear with everyone. I think any canonized creatures that make it into the last book, I will like contact creators separately and ask them to sign off on like their inclusion for this book, which will be a for-profit project. So, so there are delicate, delicate issues like that. But yeah, that's my take on the contest idea, basically. Kyra Fiskroff says... A long time supporter of this channel. How do you feel about dogs? I, li I like dogs, but I think really owning a dog should be subject to a license. I'm not kidding. I mean, everywhere in my home city, I see these people. I mean, God forgive their sins, mostly women with tiny poodle dogs. And a few months later, these dogs all get like sold off to a kennel or like they get thrown off to the street. It's just it's just atrocious. And for this reason, I think if people want look, if you people want to drive, they get a test. You know, if you if you want a cat or a dog, you must also have a test. You must have a license somehow. These animals in Turkey, people take great care of street dogs, but it's an exception all around the world. You know, they get put to sleep dog shelters around the world like every night in every dog shelter cats and dogs are being gassed to death why because their owners couldn't take care of them and they can't find any new people to take care of them either it's a horrible horrible system in my opinion it's like more ethical to leave them in the streets and at least there some people will have a chance to take care of some but no such luck in the developed west it seems but anyways that's a side issue i know this the hard way i mean when i was 12 one of our family friends had a golden retriever which had puppies and we took one of the puppies and we really liked it we really took good care of it it was called pasha but after a while it was up to my mom to take it to walks because i mean as kids we went to school every day and then lo and behold you know it got too difficult to manage and like we had to send poor pasha a very smart and loving animal too we had to send the poor dog to another family friend and i guess it must have been really traumatic for him and i, I will never live it down i mean i still feel angry at myself as a kid for wanting to have a puppy a puppy a puppy if i could travel back in time I would like kick the 12 year old me in the stomach you know I would give a bending over kick really cause no amount of pain can begin to pay for the pain this animal must have felt when it was uh, bereaved of its owners so sad so yeah must be subject to a license you know you must have a yard or like some sort of area it's not for everyone dogs and cats and dogs more than cats cats can at least live in apartments and shit but not dogs not all dogs if I get older, I am contemplating maybe getting one of those retarded old senior pugs from a shelter, but yeah, I mean, you know the saying, pets are the new kids, plants are the new pets, and I'm very happy keeping plants. I got a green thumb, so I'm good at that. I'm very ke happy keeping plants and a lot of snails, and these are like the maximum time I can afford in the middle of my daily life, my day job, my other responsibilities, and this channel. Anyways... Another question from Daniel D. Not a question, but I, I was curious and turns out you can run SimLife online. Thanks for the recommendation. SimLife is a great game from 1992, released by Maxis, the same company with, which once produced The Sims. And <coughs> it's this great game. Basically, there's a map of the world. You can design the map. It's all like pixel art level 2D, by the way. 
So there's this map of the world. You can have biomes, land, sea, mountains. You can have temperature gradients and stuff. And then you can populate it with plants and animals. And as you cycle it, you can see animals moving about, diversifying, evolving. It's just a really, really great game. And yeah, thanks to Daniel for recommending it. Before recording this, I did play SimLife on that link actually, and I will just include it in the video description and the pinned comment, so you can also go and play SimLife, I guess. Have fun and have a great time playing. Alright. Okay, we got a big list of questions from Amanda B. Let's get cracking with them and let's cap this episode after that. Amanda says, have you ever thought about writing or illustrating books for kids children's books are usually bland and boring which is a shame because kids are so smart and many of them love unusual things it's a very good very good question amanda well it's one of my pet peeves actually one of my pet pet hatreds basically in the contemporary day and, day and age there's a big boom in children's books driven forth by i'm not gonna mince words here driven forth by for the lack of a better word uh, depressed and stupid millennial and Gen X parents who want their kids to read the same kind of boring S9 shit they would want to read. So these books are like, oh I got hurt. Or like they're like naively illustrated, you know, with these fake charcoal ass looking Photoshop brushes. And people spend crazy amounts of money. It's like one of the few things parents spend money on. One of the few kinds of books that actually make money. Like kids books and weird dinosaur sex books. I kid you not. These are the only two ways in which you are guaranteed to turn books into money. Other than that, book making physical books is a losing enterprise, I am afraid to tell. And a lot of these books, even when they are about like... So imagine you are a kid, you are interested in bugs, okay? Would you rather get this amazing scientific photo book about insects of North America? But no! Heaven forbid, if your parents are these stupid ass fucking Gen Xers or Millennials, they're not gonna get you the real book, which has real pictures and really interesting bright pictures and like accurate descriptions of insects. No, they're gonna get you some crock of shit book, like, I don't know, Peter's Garden Friends or some shit in which all insects are reduced to some cartoon caricatures and like there's this like do-goody finger-wagging kind of like high... Uh, king kindergarten teacher style high strung narrative like you must have the bugs for sustainability peter here is your friend the ladybug the ladybug now sings here is the ladybug song fuck a duck get the fuck out of here every kid can tell when their parents are tooling with him or her every kid can tell a cool book a cool work of art and in this day and age, many of these kids' book books are not cool. They're just like uh, pathetic, pathetic valuata items for this depressed generation of parents to feel good about. And, well, I'm glad my parents and my grandparents were based. Like, I said, like, I want a book about lizards. And my grandfather, God rest his soul, would get me, like, the Grismek Encyclopedia of Animals or stuff like that. So I was, like, three, four, you know. I did not know how to read. I just looked at the pictures and they worked their way into my brain, which has made me who I am today. But only, anyways, like, we dunked too hard on this. But going back to Amanda's question, I have in the past... <laughs> In the far distance past, like, I once tried to do a illustration book about the planets and, and the moons. Like, the solar system has many moons, like. So I wanted to make a book about these creatures called the Bloombo Man, which are like these, like, molten jelly-like creatures. They get into a cardboard box and fly around and see every moon and planetary body in the solar system. So you got the nine planets, plus you got, like, 30 or 40 moons, you know. From Jupiter and Saturn, there are lots of weird moons, like with names like Mimas, Iapetus, just beautiful stuff. I pitched this idea to a bank which payrolls a lot of children's books, especially for science and learning. And the feedback I got was, first, they did not want the characters flying around in a box, because a box, they say, is... I mean, literally, they said something like, Dargelirli, which means like, it re recalls poor people so they wanted to replace the box cardboard box with a with a spaceship like a fucking rocket ship 
which is ridiculous because that motif itself was borrowed, quote in quotes, borrowed from Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes, which is one of the greatest uh, odes to childhood anybody could write. So first they changed that. Then they changed my Bloombo man, the blobby creatures, into children. And they wanted the three Bloombo man, there was the red, green and blue Bloombo man. They wanted them to be like one smart kid with glasses, one sporty kid with a ball, and one girl with pigtails and shit. I, I kid you not. So this is this was the second thing they wanted, okay? And third, they wanted me to leave out all the moons of the Joey and Giants because it might be, in quotes, too confusing. What you gonna do with this? What you gonna do with this? I mean, look, I've often warned against, like, the temptation of using YouTube to hate on things because, you know, hate is too easy to diss out and it feels great. When you listen to somebody hating on something else, it also feels great, but it's a toxic path. Well, here I'm going to suspend this adage and I I only... It was then that I saw that this kind of edits that this bank people committed on this book project. And granted, I'm not faultless, but their mindset, I think, is like one of the greatest, greatest threats even that uh, civilization is facing today. I found these people extremely stupid, condescending conceited imagine i mean i could maybe take in the okay change the creatures to kids i could like go with that but like removing references to jovian moons because it's too complex get fucked and die i really wish the worst on these people i hope they got the worst i don't know anyways that was that so i hope this answers my question this is why i still have a difficult time making childish drawings like purposefully toning down my art to make it more childish whatever that means so i don't think i will ever make a children's book but if somebody takes my pre-existing works and wants to write a children's book around them i won't say no either and there were also these kinds of shit books like oh wait wait let me say wait let me just see there are these books oh god Picasso for kids. God damn. There's this whole series of smarty pants art books for basically kids suffering under rich bohemian parents. And the whole series goes like Picasso was a rule breaker and he wasn't afraid. Like Banksy was a rule breaker and he wasn't afraid. Frida Kahlo was a rule breaker and she wasn't afraid. It's like disgusting. Why don't you get your kids a, a pre-existing book of Picasso or Frida Kahlo? Or fuck even Banksy, as much as I hate that character and his art and everything that he stands for. But like that sort of dilution, that sort of like Pambi Nambi dilution, there's nothing even to shock. It's just like parents already assuming their kids are as stupid as they are, but the kids are not. And they will hate you for it. I'm very sorry. Okay, 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 breaking off with that rant. CM Kozman dunks on kids books for half an hour. Okay, another question from Amanda. What is your favorite painting? that I made. I got a few, but I think my favorite painting, and if you don't know, I'm also a surrealist painter, by the way. Yes, yeah, CM Kozeman broke the rules and he wasn't afraid. Get fucked! Anyways, <laughs> the favorite painting that I made is the one I'm making. Like, I, I paint purely improvisationally, just to scratch my own itch, and I'm always curious to see what's around the corner, so it's always gonna be the painting that I didn't make. So there, everyone, these are... This is the first part of our Q&A session. If you want to ask more questions, the link is below. Always consider donating to me and I hope you enjoyed this nice little Q&A dialogue. Keep the questions coming, keep the donations coming and I hope you have a great time wherever you are. I love you all and goodbye for now.